We praise Him for that. If you haven't already, turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2. My desire today is not that this will be a history lesson, although, uh, if you're like me, I love history. Any other history lovers in here? Why? Because the Bible and every aspect of His story, that's where we get that word from, those are real people, made by God, called by God, designed by God, that are living out the plan that He made. Two weeks ago we started, three weeks ago we started the book of Daniel, and we picked up in Daniel chapter 2, and we skipped a week, which really threw me off my game. I've been chomping at the bit to get back here. So we can pick up a little bit. By a little bit of a reminder of what we talked about last time we were together, we saw the drama that was happening in King Nebuchadnezzar's court. We come to the story at a tense moment where this evil despot, well, he might not have even been that evil, but he was corrupted by absolute power. He considered himself a god like many of the ancient kings. He was, at that time, the mightiest king in the world. And he had built himself an incredible empire that had never been seen before up until that day. Nebuchadnezzar was used to getting his way. One night he's troubled by a dream. You ever, had, you ever been woke up in a cold sweat by a dream that was so strange and so real and so vivid he could remember it? But he played out a test. He wanted to test and see if the false prophets and the deceivers and the advisors, the scripture calls them astrologers and magicians, if they were the real thing. And so, so the test is going to be, I'm not going to tell you what my dream was. You have to tell me what my dream was and then interpret its meaning for me, and then I'll believe you. And they whined and said, oh, okay, that's never been done in the history of the world. No king has ever asked for such a thing. Well... You don't make that guy angry, all right? So he sent out a decree all over the city, all over the kingdom, that all of the wise men would be destroyed. The good, like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, along with the evil. And my friends, when evil people rule, when godless and corrupt and absolute power people rule, the good suffer right along with the wicked. But how does Daniel respond to this crisis? Does, does he get wrapped up in this drama and go home and, ah, ah! <clears throat> Pardon me. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He goes and finds his closest and most trusted friends and says, pray urgently with me that God will answer. I bought us some time. God has given us some time. I have a night. Maybe tonight will be the night when God will show himself to me. He had faith in the face of that fear. And we talked about that this morning. We talked about different kinds of fear. The evil fear that holds us captive and destroys us, that's from Satan. Or the godly fear that has more respect and more reverence for what the heart of God sees and knows and cares about that when we care about. And that's the kind of fear Daniel had. And so that kind of godly fear casts out the other kind of fear. We call that faith. Faith is to be persuaded that what God has said is so. And Daniel has been practicing that since he was a young man. He chose to decide with his father and obey. That's the first story we read about him. That's what this whole book is about. It's about Daniel and other characters who chose faith over human fear because they really knew who God was and what he wanted. And that gave them confidence in the face of the most impossible things. You know, there's a verse, Joe, maybe you remember the reference. The Lord's secret is with those who fear Him. I find that very interesting. It suggests that God reveals mysteries and secrets and wonders to those who are nearest and dearest to Him that He does not show to other people. And Daniel, the book would seem to suggest that. Because that's exactly what God does. He reveals to Daniel both the dream and its meaning. And in verse 20, Daniel jumps out of bed that morning and says, Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to Him. It is He who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is He who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. Let's stop there. And let's turn ahead again now to the second part of this message. What actually was the dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had? 
Daniel gives credit to God and says, I'm here standing before you, Nebuchadnezzar, to tell you what God has said. It's not in me. It's not about me. But it's so that you will know about that God. You think there's a reason God chose this moment and chose His servant? God will put each one of you into a situation. He'll take His person, His people, and put them in a situation so that you can make known the name of Jesus that we sang about this morning. So that those that are lost, those that are needy, will see that there is power, that there is life, that there is healing in the name of Jesus Christ only. And you're his ambassador. Paul writes, we have this treasure in earthen vessels of the excellency and the power may be of God and not of us. And so now that the stage is set and the king of the known world is sitting there with rapt attention, Daniel says in verse 31, you, O king, were looking and behold... There was a great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were crushed all at the same time. It became like chaff from the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Let's stop there for a second. I don't know how many of you remember this. A couple weeks ago, I sent you home with some homework. How dare I? Part of that homework was to also read... Daniel chapter 7, in conjunction with chapter 2, because it shows the same vision or dream again in slightly different terms. So if you don't mind, we're going to turn there and look at that for a minute, all right? Turn to Daniel chapter 7. Now Daniel has this vision. The vision is so vivid and so strange, he's the one who wakes up in a cold sweat and is desperate and troubled to know the meaning of it. It begins in verse 1, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, this is after, so this happened after this episode of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay in his bed, and he wrote his dream down and related the following summary of it. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. The first one was like a lion, and had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind was also given to it. And behold, a second beast resembling a bear, and it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth, and thus they said to it, Arise, devour, much meat. And after this I kept looking, behold, another one, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying, extremely strong. It had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from all the other beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up from among them, and three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots before it. And behold, this man possessed eyes like the eyes of horn possessed eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. And I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. I wonder who that is. His vesture was like white snow, and the hairs of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames, its wheels were burning fire, a river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were opened. And I kept looking, because the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking, I kept looking until the beast was slain, and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts and their dominion, it was taken away. But an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Amen. Amen. 
That's awesome. That reads like Revelation. Indeed it does. There are some passages in Revelation that almost say that word for word. I tie those two together because I want you to see this is not a boring history lesson, but it is, after all, his story. Where do you think that word ever came from? And God tells a story. To him, it is all eternally present. He dwells in the past. He dwells in the present. He dwells in the future. And he knows, in the greatest detail, what shall come to pass and why. He says it in Isaiah. He says, I have set forth my word, and who shall prevent it? Who will let it? I have spoken, who will, and I will bring it to pass. The theme of the book of Daniel uttered out of the mouth of Nebuchadnezzar himself. Remember what it was? Daniel 4, 35. I'll read it for you. Nebuchadnezzar gets a sandy back and he says the theme of the book of Daniel. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? So let's take a look at the interpretation of these dominions. Here's a graphic of that great statue with its gold and its silver and its bronze and its iron being shattered by a stone not cut with men's hands. I think the imagery here is really clear. The interpretation of the dream is actually pretty amazing. Turn back to Daniel chapter 2, would you? It's so obvious in hindsight what the interpretation of the dream is. The first kingdom. All right. This is the dream. Now we will tell its interpretation before the king. Verse 37. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the Lord God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand, and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. You see, in Nebuchadnezzar's day, he was a complete despot. We've already said that, right? That means absolute authority of breath and life and death, and every detail of his, of his subject's existence was indeed his to control. When you were part of the kingdom of Babylon, if you had the king's favor one day, you were the most blessed and wealthy man in the kingdom. But his favor could turn against you, and he disposed of you, however he saw fit. See, there had never been such centralized, focused power in one person before. And the splendor and the wealth that he had First of all, we see this symbol in the dream as well. So I want you to tie Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 together. And think about those four parts that were compared. In the dream, Babylon is pictured as a winged lion, which ironically is one of the symbols of Babylon. It's a pretty dead giveaway. This is from part of a fresco on the walls of ancient Babylon. Babylon was the most feared and often evil empire of the Old Testament. So evil and so corrupt and so powerful, in fact, that it's an imagery that's repeated in Revelation in the New Testament. And it's a picture of absolute power and corruption that fills the whole earth and contaminates it. That's what we read about in Revelation. But nobody had ever been able to do what Nebuchadnezzar was in the 40 years that he reigned. He amassed wealth and power and authority and splendor and built things that had never been before been seen. I don't know how well you can see this map, but I just want you to see the slightly... Uh, colored area there, where Mesopotamia, the Holy Land, and Babylonia, all the way to Persia, which is modern day Iran, is all covered under his territory. It's pretty big. All the way down almost to Egypt. And people from all those places, what he would do is he would leave a remnant of people in the cities that he conquered to keep them under subjection, to pay tax, to manage the fields and keep their houses up. Because he didn't want it to be a ruin. <laughs> but if most people ever got the notion, like the kings of Jerusalem did, Zedekiah said, ah, I've been a king for around for a couple of years. I'm 18 years old. Hey, the smartest I ever was in my life was when I was 18 years old. I've only been getting dumber since. So Zedekiah had this idea that he'd rebel against Babylon. Babylon came and crushed it. I mean, he crushed it. That wasn't usually his way. But not only that, he built a glorious city of blue and gold that can be seen for hundreds of miles in the plains of Shinar. And Babylonia. 
And this is just a replica, of course, because God tore it down. He promised, he prophesied that because of Babylonia's evil and cruelty to his people in particular, that it would be destroyed. I believe it was Jeremiah, in fact, that said, if anyone ever rebuilds the city of Babylon, he will do so with the death of his firstborn, and he will lay its foundation after, with, at the cost of his other son as well. And ironically, I, I remember there was this guy named Saddam. You remember him? Mm -hmm. This little jerk. His mission in life was to build Babylon and make it his capital city, and he lost both his sons and failed in the attempt. God's word is true. That just happened a few years ago, by the way. Battle. The Bible prophecy doesn't happen in Daniel's day. It happens today. It is happening. Amen. But you have this beautiful city that's surrounded by walls of gold. The, the city walls were so thick, they used to have chariot races around the top of the walls, seven across. Nebuchadnezzar also built the hanging gardens for his wife as a wedding gift. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Nobody had ever seen or dreamed of anything so amazing as the hanging gardens of Babylon. It was the greatest kingdom, the most centralized, glorious kingdom of all time. But it didn't last very long. Because now we come to this second kingdom that overtakes the first. After you there will arise another kingdom inferior to you and another kingdom of bronze which will rule over all the earth. Man, he just groups those two right together. Boom, boom, boom. So the second beast in Daniel's vision and the second part of this statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream is the Medo-Persian Empire. We see in Daniel chapter 5, I believe it is, Daniel's still around. He survived. I believe it is Nebuchadnezzar's nephew, Belshazzar, the last remaining king of Babylon. He sees the, the hand of the wall and his drunken feast, meaning, mm -hmm. meaning, tekel of parson. I won't tell the whole story because maybe we'll preach on it later. Daniel was called out of seclusion. he kind of been forgotten over the years. Forty years later, he came out, he gave the dream, the vision interpretation, and said, this night is the kingdom. Rested from you because you have been you've been weighed and found wanting, and that night Persia came in and ripped the kingdom out of the, out of Babylon's hands. What's the big deal about that? Well, in Daniel's dream, you see the second beast is a bear. It's very strangely described. It's a bear that's that's not equal. It's not balanced. It's raised up on one side. It says, and there are three ribs in its mouth. Now I'm interested. Who else here likes ribs? And he's told, eat those babies, devour them. And so he does. When Cyrus the Great decided to come out of Persia, he was Babylonia's neighbor, he made a plan and a vision. So he combined with another man whose name was Darius. And between Cyrus the Great and Darius the First, they had a joint Medo-Persian Empire. But Cyrus was not going to give complete equal power. He was the greatest. He reigned out of Susan, or Susa. Maybe you've heard that name from the book of Esther before. And he sent Darius as a general to go conquer Babylonia. And then, da then Darius ruled from Babylon. And his descendants were Darius II, Darius III, etc., etc. But you see in that vision where that bear is unequal. And then it's told the devourer and has three ribs in the smalls. In three military campaigns, Cyrus and Darius defeated all of the previous kingdoms and, and empires of their work. In three in three military campaigns. And so we see these details fulfilled in perfect unison with the promised Word of God. Does anybody know what Isaiah 45 verse 1 says? You can look it up if you want. But 700 years before this event with Cyrus and Darius, the Lord promised, I, will, I have chosen my servant Cyrus. That to go and deliver my people and return them to the land and to rebuild my house. Some of Cyrus's wise men came and read that scripture. Look what we found in our search of the, of the Hebrew Bible and of the ancient writings. We found your name. Hundreds and hundreds of years before you showed up on earth. He was impressed. He said, guess what I'm going to do today? I'm going to send out a decree that sends Israel back to its land and we're going to give them what they need rebuild their homes and rebuild their temple. Cyrus did that, a pagan king who acknowledged God. Mm -hmm. The Word of God is powerful and amazing. Now, the Persian Empire lasted for 
centuries. It's it expanded the area by far. Is there a map on here? There it is. So right here, where's my little pointer thinger? Right here. I don't think you can see that. So here's where Babylonia had been, right here. Cyrus took that and Darius expanded that, and they all go all the way to India, and all the way past Egypt into Libya, and Sudan, and all the way into Macedonia and Greece. That's how far the Persian Empire expanded. It was amazing. But it was not as rich or centralized in one ruler like it was under Babylonia. Does that make sense? And that's why it's silver rather than the head of gold. And then we have a third king. Which one is that, folks, according to your word, according to Scripture? It doesn't say here, but it says it in Daniel chapter 7. There is a third beast that comes up out of the sea. And by the way, this imagery of the sea, I wondered about that, where Daniel has this vision of this teeming, tumultuous sea. That is the chaotic people of the earth. All the nations of the earth and the four winds of the earth represent, of course, the four directions, north, south, east, and west. But it also represents, in Revelation and throughout the Bible, as the judgment and the hand of God sending these creatures as his agents to his people. And this is where Daniel is particularly interested. Yes, these events affect the whole known civilized world, but Daniel is particularly concerned. In fact, God is particularly concerned about how it affects his people Israel and ultimately his promised Messiah, the Ancient of Days, and the Son of Man. Isn't that interesting? That's where it's all headed. Greece and Macedonia. Sorry, I think this print is a little small for you to read. Think about the book of Esther. There's a story in there, how the story begins. Hagiaris, also known as Artaxerxes. But again, Artaxerxes or Xerxes, that was just a term that was used for the kings of Persia. His real name was Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus had a great drunken feast with all his rulers and his subjects and his governors. He invited them to his palace and said, I'm going to call my wife out to do a dance and display her beauty or something so that all, everybody can gawk at her in their drunken stupor. She won't have that. So she hears the order and she says, no. Okay. And again, he's a despot, he's furious, and so he responds with great cruelty and severity. And says, enough of her. It's time to get a new queen. But what was going on there that made Ahasuerus so angry and made such a stupid request? During the reign of Ahasuerus, he assaulted the Greek states three different times. Remember this. This is secular history, by the way. Secular history as it ties in the scripture. He was desperate to create a new coalition of all his rulers and all his empire at that special banquet and feast to win their favor because his kingdom was falling apart. He was losing control of the empire, starting with the Greeks. And after the Battle of Salamis, navy there outside of Athens, and finally, a third battle in 479 B.C., the Greeks kicked out the Persians. They had their freedom. But they hated the Persians, and they never forgot it. So much so, that a man came along named Philip of Macedon, Philip I, Philip II, another kingly term. You guys ever heard of the book of Philippians? For those who lived in Philippi, yeah, it's named after King Philip. He consolidated his army. He united the Greeks and the Macedonians. Macedonians up there to the north. That guy. Nobody cares, right? Well, you can't even see this either, but there's Macedonia to the north and Greeks to the south. He united those two. And that's very hard to do, by the way, because the Greeks are never united. They have what's called city-states, which means each king ruled a city, and the area around that city was an autonomous, independent nation, as you were, who ruled themselves differently and separately from, say, the city next door. So you'd have Florida Bay. It's its own kingdom. Well, Pass, its own kingdom. Nakati, Cray, it's all its own kingdom. They would finally unite under crisis if there was a huge war to go to, like go fight Troy or go fight Xerxes. He, he united them into one force, Macedonia and Greece, and set it up so that this guy right here could do what he wanted to do. Anybody know who that is? Just take a guess. Alexander the Great. Thank you. This is not hard. God knew Alexander the Great the details of his life very well. He chose him, he set him up. All these men are tools in his hands. 
As a young man, 20 years old, he decided to go and avenge his father because his father was assassinated by a Persian spy. And so he uses an excuse to fulfill his destiny and satisfy his ambition. And he started out to do something that was never done. And this young man, in just a matter of three to four years, conquered the entire known world. Did he do that on his own, or did God allow him? Because he had promised in Daniel that it would be so. Interesting. And that's how big his kingdom got. So he added the kingdoms of Macedonia and Greece. He expanded it in Africa, and he expanded halfway through mm -hmm. India. Nobody before, except the, the myths of old, like Hercules or Zeus, ever made it to those parts of the world. So he said, I'm going to do it too, because Hercules ain't no better than me. And he begged and begged his generals to go further. But by the time they made it to India and saw elephants for the first time and got squished by elephants, they said, we're done. We've been doing this for years. We want to go home. He begged and pleaded with them to keep going to stay longer. But he wouldn't. And on his way back, traveling through Babylon, he decided to take Babylon and make that his capital. Interesting enough, mm -hmm. that beautiful place that he took from Darius the Fourth and made it his own, he got sick and he died there without instating and without having an heir for his king. And so you see this leopard with four wings on his back who moved very swiftly. In just a short time, that leopard takes over the entire known world. But when Alexander died, his empire was divided up among his four generals, the four wings that carried this leopard across the world. And I know I'm not going to remember all of them. Leginus, Cassander, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. There you go. <laughs> and they divided that kingdom up into four places, and maybe those are names you've heard. Ptolemy got Egypt and Africa. Seleucus got Asia. Cassander took over Greece and Macedonia. And Leginus took over Asia Minor. And initially, the Holy Land. And of course, then these four start fighting together to see who has the supremacy. And the kingdom fell apart. Now, who cares about these things? Why do they matter? Well, you've heard of Ptolemy IV. Have you heard of Cleopatra? Have you heard of Cleopatra? She was actually Cleopatra IV, but nobody remembers the other three. She was the great, 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 great going on granddaughter of Ptolemy I, Alexander's friend. Yes, Greeks ruled Egypt as pharaohs and kings and queens for many years. You ever heard of Julius Caesar? You ever heard of Anthony? Mark Anthony? Yeah. That's when Rome comes on the scene. This fourth and final Iron Kingdom that takes over from the Greeks. The Iron Legs and the Terrible Beast. There's, they're wondering, he doesn't really describe what this beast in Daniel chapter 7 is. It's like it's beyond description. But it's been surmised by scholars and by commentary writers over the years that he probably, based on what we read in Revelation as additional insight into Daniel, was probably a dragon. Something that is an Israelite he would not have been familiar with, but if he had been Asian, he would have known what a dragon was. Rome was the largest and the most oppressive of all the kingdoms, but it was also the most, most disjointed and the most republican in nature, if you know what I mean by that. They came over and took over other nations, but they just also then let them be. But they set up governors and magistrates to, to oversee the law and enforce civility, give people rights and privileges as citizens. It was the most republican form of government the world had ever seen up to that point. Unless you want to count the few short days where Greece was a democracy, which fell apart, as democracies always do. <laughs> Interestingly, you see that you have two legs in the statue, right? Rome, even though it was a great king, was eventually divided into eastern and western capitals. With Constantinople being the capital of the eastern empire, and Rome being the capital in Italy of the western empire. So it was divided, eventually. 
Anybody? If you ever get a chance to go visit Rome, for example, or any of these places in the world, you will see the remnants and the lasting. As long as this world lasts, there will be remnants and influences from this empire. You see that most of the mainland of Europe, including England, parts of Scotland that are overtaken, including most of what used to be the Persian and Babylonian empires, were all incorporated into that. They lost a little bit. And then with that, they brought a common language, right? Greek and Latin. The higher classes spoke Greek, the common classes spoke Latin. And that's why even to this day, the Catholic Church uses Latin in its masses or in its services. And languages like what? Spanish, Italian, French, they're all Latin-based. If you know some of those languages, you know quite a bit of Latin. The influence of Rome is permanent. Here's a picture of a road I took that I walked on. It's part of the Appian Way. It's in a lot better shape than most of the roads around here. Side to side. And it's been there for a couple thousand years. You can drive a car on that, and people use these roads every day. South side. Here's an aqueduct. This is how Romans carried water from outside of the cities for miles and miles into their cities so that they could have running water, plumbing, bathhouses. We don't have that here. <laughs> Look how well structured that is. It's still carrying water without leaks today. What is this? This is the roof of the Pantheon. I'm looking up, okay? There's a big hole in the ceiling, and there's a reflecting pool down in the floor underneath that ceiling hole where it collects all the rainwater as a reflecting pool. It is a temple built to all the gods. I'm sure the Apostle Paul would have preached something there with that in mind. You, have, you are very superstitious, I see, but I have to preach one God to you that you have not heard of. <coughs> this dome is a couple thousand years old as well. It is a solid one piece of concrete. That's right, the, the Romans invented concrete. I cannot make concrete that lasts for a few years, let alone solidly for people to live in and walk under and view every single day for a couple thousand. I have no idea how they did it. Nobody does. These guys were good. Really good. And yet we also see that in 475, Rome had become so wicked and corrupt and decentralized and filled with vices, immorality, corruption, homosexuality, entertainment. <coughs> it lost all its virtue, lost all of its power. The Byzantine Emperor lasted for another thousand years until the Ottoman Empire the Muslims overcame it, took it over in 453, 1400, 1453, the 1400s, the Middle Ages, there was still a Roman Empire. There you have it, the Roman Empire often copied, but never replaced. Charlemagne called himself the Holy Roman Emperor. You have the Roman Catholic Church. All these things that tried to replace it and evoke in people's minds power. Stability, strength, endurance. They all failed to do it. I think we might even have time to finish this today, but I better hurry up. Now we get to the strange part where you have these toes that are mixed with clay and iron. Ten of them. And this imagery of ten kingdoms, or ten groups, if you will, is repeated in Daniel chapter 7. It's repeated in Revelation quite a bit actually, 14, 19, 7 I believe, we have described for us a dragon that comes up out of the sea to devour God's people. He has seven heads and on his seven heads are ten crowns. And just like in Daniel chapter 7, there is this little horn that rises up with boastful words and eyes like a man. He consolidates three of those ten kingdoms and overcomes them. He's described in Revelation and in Thessalonians as this man of pride who exalts himself against God and speaks evil and boastful things. And I can tell you that there is no character in history yet that has perfectly fit that prophecy. This is where I put my work in this week. All this stuff was old news to me and I loved it. I've read all those battles and histories and fun things before and I love it. Sorry if you don't. But what I couldn't get a handle on is what are the ten toes? Who knew that ten toes were so elusive and important? 
And I read like 20 different interpretations of different commentators and people in the past who said, oh, the ten toes, those are the ten tribes that came, and the Visigoths and the Goths, and the, they sacked Rome and they have little kingdoms. I don't buy it. That don't hold water. Remember when I told you a couple weeks ago that prophecy is like a mountain range? Where when God foretells something that's going to happen, you see each of the events successively, chronologically, but you have no idea how far apart those events are from each other. God, standing up above from his viewpoint, knows exactly what he's talking about. And once it comes to happen, unless he explicitly states it, like he does very kindly in Daniel chapter 2 and 7, he said exactly who those were. This is the Greeks. This is the Medes and Persians. This is you, King. He identified them. That's nice. What about all the times that God doesn't tell you what it means? Daniel was left wondering, still chewing his fingernails, what am I seeing here, Lord, in Daniel chapter 7? And God didn't tell him. He did not identify those people. To me, that tells me this probably is something that has yet to happen. He describes it as a future event that we think is going to happen right after the others. But that's not necessarily so. This little horn that utters boastful things, he's been identified as Antiochus Epiphanes the Great, who ruled over the Jews and started the Maccabean Revolt. By the way, this all happened after and in between the Old and New Testaments. There's a time where God seems to go silent, if you will, in the revealing of his word. That doesn't mean nothing happened. In the time between the Old and New Testaments, yes, Israel was restored from Babylonian captivity, but this is where I am. Alexander the Great comes in. This is where his generals come in. This is where the Seleucids come in. This is where the constant revolt of the Jews against oppression comes in. This is where the Romans come in. All these things happen to God's people. They're at the belly button of the world. That's what we call them, the belly button of the world. Because it seems like all of history and all the promises of God revolve, even today, do they not? Look what's going on with Israel. Look what's going on with God's people, even though they don't know they are His people. How many times in history has God's people not known that they're His? Or not lived like it? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He says in his heart. We talked about that this morning. I appreciate that distinction. Verbally with his mouth, he might say, I believe in God, but he lives his life as though he does not exist. And how often is mankind guilty of doing that very thing? They have an intellectual or verbal assent to God, but in the life, they are sitting on the kingdom. They are autonomous. They're in charge. That's a lie, by the way. That's a myth. And this theme of the sovereignty of God in the book of Daniel proves that at every step. That we are all just tools and vessels in His hands, performing His perfect will. Nothing will happen without His notice. Nothing will happen without His direction. And it is coming to a good, good conclusion. I'm going to suggest to you that these toes of iron and clay suggest instability. They suggest upheaval and division and disagreement. They, ex they suggest coexistence. You can coexist, but you can't hold together. And that's why they're real. That's why they're frail. They're, they're there for a time, but in this culture, in these kingdoms, whatever they are, they're ready for the final great event of history. And I would suggest to you that we are living in those days right now. This culture of coexistence, of truly division and disagreement, brittle upheaval. I don't know what better thing could describe right now. So my point is to you watch and pray when you read these things, when you see these things, when you hear these things. And know that God's word has said these things will be so all along. Isn't it nice that we know Him? Isn't it nice that we belong to Him? And that we can be His servants? Better yet, we can be His children? Jesus said, I have called you my friends. Because everything that God has made known to me, I have made known to you. My friends, if you know the Lord Jesus, you have the only essential thing that you truly need in this life. Amen. But not only that, the Lord's secret is with those that fear Him.
Look what he showed to Daniel. Look what he shows to us. I've often said, oh man, look at those lucky disciples. Look what they got. They got to see Jesus and handle him and eat with him and ask him questions. Well, why can't you? We're told in Hebrews that the people on whom these latter things have come, we are the most blessed in all the world. We have the things that disciples didn't have. We have blessings that Daniel didn't have. We have blessings that John, the Red Revelation, and all the heroes of the faith did not have. We are very blessed and fortunate with the word that Jesus has revealed to us. And not only that, He lives in us. And so we come to the end of this vision. Whatever those ten toes are, they get powderized. So what do they matter much? Because who powderizes them? The stone covered on men's hands. And you see that language in Peter. You see that language in Hebrews. In the, 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 the stone that the builders have rejected has become the capstone, has become the foundation of all things that God is going to do. And Daniel gets to see Jesus appear before the Ancient of Days, his father, and receive, like Psalm 2, the blessing and the scepter of iron which, which he will rule the entire world. And he gets to come in and make all things right. That stone cut without man's hands comes down and powderizes the best efforts of Satan and the Antichrist and the beast and all the nations of man. And he sets up a kingdom that grows into a mountain that covers the whole earth. And it will never be moved. It will never be changed. I'm reminded of Philippians 2. I can picture Nebuchadnezzar and Darius and Alexander and all those Roman emperors bowing down, admitting and confessing that Jesus Christ is the Lord, is the glory of God the Father, and giving an account one day for all the things that they did in the flesh, along with each of you, along with me. We will stand before that Jesus. Did you read anything in Revelation over the last couple of weeks, by the way, as I asked? We're going to close there today and turn there to that. When Jesus, the great conqueror, comes, I believe it's chapter 19. The beast from the sea that I just told you about is Revelation chapter 19. Chapter 16 and 17 comes up again. And 18... Babylon falls. So somebody tries to rebuild it. It becomes an entity that deceives the whole world. There it is. Chapter 19. I'm going to read all the way down through verse 19. Okay, what's wrong with reading God's Word? After these things, I heard something like a voice of great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belongs to our God because His judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot, that Babylon, who was corrupt in the earth and her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bound servants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sits on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne, saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bond servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and the sound of many waters and like the sound of a mighty peal of thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. I can't wait to hear what heavenly music and praise sounds like. We do well to mimic their praises, but my friends, it's just a shadow. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. Are you ready? It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Speaking of the bridegroom, Jesus, here he is. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. Here he comes. The stone. The mountain. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. 
and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies which are in heaven, clothed in the linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, Psalm 2, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh is the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Stop there for a second. We have this image of Jesus, meek and mild, walking barefoot or in sandals on the dusty streets of Galilee. And my friends, that is true. He came to us completely empty and humble as a child to live as a vessel of God's righteousness and also God's wrath for us on this earth for a short time. Interestingly, he and Alexander the Great both lived to 33 years old. I believe there's been great poet work written contrasting those two people. How completely different they were. And how when the end of things comes, <laughs> Alexander the Great will have nothing and Jesus will have everything. But if people want to know what Jesus is like now, and what he'll be like when he comes again, and when they see him, it will be very different. We studied this morning about the fear of the Lord, how the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And my friends, the person of Jesus is whom this fear is rooted in. If we have reverence and if we have respect for this mighty God to whom all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, but He will do His will and nobody will prevent Him, we should worship Him. If you have deference for His authority and for the shots that He calls and for your perspective on life being oriented to what He says, what He thinks, what He knows, you will have no cause for the terror that the masses of the earth will have when they see him coming in the clouds of glory. It will be terrifying to most people. And his robes will be dipped in blood. Their blood. Blood flowing as high as the horse's reins for miles and miles and miles. For those who rebel against the Son of Man. But if you fear him now, you have no cause to fear him then. It's going to be a great and glorious rejoicing day. That's right. This is what Daniel's about. It's about Jesus. So what does that say for you? As we go home today, so what? Well, what do you have to fear? What do you have to worry about? What, uh, what pet sin or pet struggle do you have to hold on to in the face of this reality? What really matters in your pursuit with this in mind? Can you trust Him? Can you obey Him? Can you surrender to Him? Can you serve Him? Can you delight and be in awe of Him like Daniel was? <laughs> That's how Nebuchadnezzar responded at the end of Daniel chapter 2. He gives this interpretation. And Nebuchadnezzar stands up and prostrates himself before Daniel and says, Your God is the God of gods. He has revealed this to you. Now, Nebuchadnezzar didn't get saved that day. I don't know if he ever did. He still believed in his other gods. But he acknowledged that Daniel's God was greater than they were. And this, this mighty king of the earth bowed down before Daniel and tried to offer incense to him. And said, get up. Kind of like this angel with, with, with John. Get up. Don't worship me. Worship God. God can do whatever He wants with whomever He wants. Do you believe that? Yes. He can save anybody. He can deliver anybody. He can condemn anybody. And He will. His will will be done. Your part, my part, is to get on board and look up and look to him and say, What's Lord? What what's next? What do you want me to do next? I can't wait to see. And to give him praise and to acknowledge him so that everybody in the world will know there is a God. Who put you in that place someday if he hasn't already? What will you do then? Will you be like Daniel in your own little way? Maybe you'll just be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel said, oh, by the way, king, before you honor me and make me the most important dude in Babylon, I don't really want that, but i got three friends who prayed with me through this whole event. 
Please honor Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Maybe you could be one of them. Maybe when your Daniel friend says, oh, pray for me, I'm going through it right now. Let's get together and pray that God moves right here, right now. When you pray and you do battle with God's people, He remembers you. He honors those who honor Him. So you may not be a Daniel, but maybe be a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and pray for others to have victory and success. Their success, God's success, the Son's success is ours. He will exalt us in due time. Lord, we could go on and on and on today, and I hope that I didn't wear anybody out too bad. But how glorious is your vision. How marvelous are your ways. Nothing is too difficult for you. Nothing is a surprise to you. Even the wicked are made for the day of judgment. Even the lost rulers, men and kingdoms, are your servants. Even Satan himself is bound to obey you. And he hates it. But ultimately, he is your servant too. But we thank you that we've read the back of the book and we win. Thank you that we belong to you. Thank you that we can be part of your great and glorious agenda that you have written down in the pages of your word. Thank you, Lord, that we can look at the pages of your story and see that everything has come out exactly as you said it would. You're so good. You are so able. Help us to trust you. Help us to not be consumed with earthly cares. Help us not to be distracted by our desires and our little worries and our little anxieties. Lord, some of them aren't that little. We're little. That's the thing. We need you. We need your view. We need your strength. We need your upholding hand. We need your rescue from so many things. Please be a rescuer. Be a rescuer for our need right where we are. Be a rescuer for our neighbors and our families and our friends that don't know you. Oh, we're a burden for their salvation, for their orientation, that their world would revolve around what you say matters what is a great change we pray for our nation we pray for its leaders we pray lord that you would bring a revival if you would but just like other kingdoms lord that you would take this little empire this kingdom and use it however you want it belongs to you that's all we want lord jesus we just want to belong to you we want to hear your voice and follow you and be close to you as possible keep us in the palm of your amazing hand Thank you for loving us first. Thank you that we have such blessing and, and even victory and authority in Jesus' name imprinted on us. That the blessings of heaven and earth are ours in Him. And none is able to take us out of His hand. We pray all these things in His name and for His honor and glory. Amen.